Good evening. Good evening and welcome to the May 4th, 2022 uh, COG meeting. If you could please stand for the pledge. So with that, we have um, consent agenda. Is that right? Not public comment? No, it comes before the regular agenda. Okay. The regular agenda. I didn't even see it on here. Okay. Anyway, we have consent agenda. Um, there are multiple items on the consent agenda. Is there any board member that wishes to pull a consent agenda item? Oh, okay. Is there any public member? No? Um, I do. I am going to be for number three. Is there any public comment? Okay. With that, is there a motion to approve consent agenda item one and two? I'll move. Okay. I'll second. Okay, we moved by Gay, seconded by Alvin. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Um, okay. I think they're just simple answers for you. Is it going to Kyrie? Yeah, okay. Um, so there's two, these are both combined. Is, are we communicating with Caltrain to make sure we're submitting these together instead of how we've normally done them quarterly? Yes, they've been, we okay. followed up with them every month of TAC. So okay. They uh, were with us on that whole process. It was to improve our internal processes and make things more transparent and easier for them to audit. Okay. 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 I just, and then go I on. Just add, oh. Caltrans at our TAC meeting in April, um, they did request that we separate them out. Kylie had had it combined for the two quarters. Um, they gave their input and Kylie separated them into quarter one and two, submitted them, and they emailed back confirmation that they've received and accepted them. Okay, perfect. Okay, that's all I have. Are there any questions from other board members? No? Okay, with that, is there any public comment? If none, is there a motion to move consent agenda item number three? So moved. Second. Got it, Aaron? Thank you. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Next is regular agenda item number four, public comment. Is there any public comment? And I'm going to start with online. See none? Okay. Is there any public comments in the audience? See none? We'll move on to regular agenda item number five, which is Caltrans report. And Marlon, are you on? Oh, there you are. Hi. Hello, hello, Madam Chair, and hello to the board. Um, thank you for the opportunity this evening. I just want to provide just some very brief updates for the board tonight. Um, first of all, I, I also want to mention uh, thank you, uh, Kylie, for and also Amanda. Thank you for mentioning the overall work program. We really appreciate um, Calvary's cost coordination, and um, you know we continue to hopefully uh, coordinate if there's any. Um, questions, comments, concerns regarding the overall work program, uh, we're happy to c continue our coordination. Um, however, I, I do want to just mention some very brief updates. Um, first of all, we did have our, we are having safety stand downs um, this week. And this is basically, well, last week we had our, our workers memorial event um, last Thursday, and that was the Actually, that was in uh, April. <laughs> that was uh, Thursday the 28th. We had our District 10 Workers Memorial. Um, actually, this was in Sacramento at the west steps of the Capitol building. Um, it's just another reminder for us that we need to make sure safety is first and foremost, and not only for our traveling public, but also for our Caltrans staff as well. And so um, I'm happy to report that we did not have any Caltrans um, uh, staff that has been deceased as of uh, this past fiscal year. However, we have had folks that have worked with Caltrans on projects um, that have unfortunately deceased. So 
Um, this is something, safety is something that we take very much in uh, consideration. It is our top priority as a department, and we just want to share that with you all. And we do have messages that you'll be seeing along our roadways, especially our changeable message signs, um, encouraging and acknowledging um, safety first and foremost. So I, I just wanted to share that message with the board tonight. Um, also, I do would I also would like to mention our um, bicycle pedestrian advisory committee. Um, we do have um, a meeting coming up. A little bit later um, this fiscal year, uh, we just had a, a committee event um, in April, and we will like to have another meeting. Um, this will be on a quarterly basis, but it will be in June of this year. And once we have the date set, we'll send out the invitation to our local partners. Please feel free to participate if you are interested. May is our bike month at Caltrans, and so we will be hosting um, several events. However, um, since we are transitioning back into the office, we're not going to hold an official ride this year, but we're happy to support any um, partner rides that are happening around our region. Um, the last two things I wanted to mention for, the, for tonight was our um, SB1, Senate Bill 1, uh, Road Repair and Accountability Act. We have just awarded our CTC, our California Transportation Commission, has awarded $34.7 million for sustainable transportation projects. Um, this is all across the state, but we want to emphasize that bicycle and pedestrian projects um, and also accessibility plans, projects, and accessibility. That is a big priority for Caltrans. Uh, we do have our um, active transportation program, Cycle 6, that is currently out for uh, locations. If anybody is interested, we are happy to partner with any partners that are considering applying for the active transportation program. Um, the very last thing I want to mention is for our sustainable transportation planning grant program, we are, um, we, we just finished um, our awards for the last round of the uh, transportation planning grant. However, we're gonna continue uh, with some workshops coming up in the summertime for our next round of sustainable transportation planning grants. Once we do have uh, more information on the specific dates, we'll share that with you all. And Actually, I do have one more thing I would like to share with the board. I know there's been some, um, I guess, concern and also questioning on, on whether or not or when um, Evans Pass will be open fully for the summer, and we are still keeping track on that. However, many of you have probably seen that we've moved the, the gates up or the barriers up further, um, and we anticipate that they will be in place for another couple of weeks and as we receive um, further word from our maintenance team we'll pass that along regarding the opening of Ebbets Pass and this, the same goes for Sonora Pass as well. Um, that concludes my updates and I'm happy to take any questions or comments and thanks for the time. Thank you Marlon. Is there any questions? Oh, John? Yeah, Mara, I just wanted to say that I had the pleasure, actually, of driving down to San Diego this last weekend. And for the first time in, in a number of years, I was happily impressed with the quality of the roads going down to and coming back from. And I'm certain it's a credit to SB1 and its successful implementation by many district offices throughout the state. So I just wanted to compliment Caltrans. The roads are in far better shape than they have been in the years past that I've gone down there. I was surprised to be introduced to the tollroads.com, which tagged me for $8.82 for the 12 miles I drove on Highway 73. But I guess that's also a solution that uh, restricts traffic down there as well. It certainly was very minimal when I took it. So anyway, I just want to pass along my compliments to Caltrans. I can see how SB1 is benefiting all of us statewide. Thank you. Any other comments? Thank you, Marlon. Appreciate it. The next is regular agenda item number six. 
Uh, local agency updates. Are there any local agents? Hi, Mr. Packenger. Good afternoon. Many things are occurring with the Wagon Trail project. <clears throat> Let me begin with uh, letting you know that I received a call last week um, <clears throat> by a, a person that works in Senator Feinstein's office who was working on our request for the funding for the eastern portion of the project. She asked me some questions um, related to what we were using the funding for. I was able to pass on to her the link to the work that we're doing for the current work. I gave her all sorts of information and she liked it. So hopefully that's a, uh, a good sign. She told me that she would be submitting a request. So let's see where that goes. That was, uh, that was last week that that occurred. Um, as far as construction activity on the site, many of you have seen what has been going on. The trees are removed. They're working with uh, heavy equipment, doing the earthwork. I have requested that uh, at a time when it's convenient for them that we could get a tour of what's going on. So I'll wor I'm working on that with the construction management firm and with the contractor to see an appropriate time that it's safe for us to do it. Um, since they started the heavy earthwork activities in the beginning of April or so, the end of uh, March, we're letting them kind of get their, their uh, process going nice and easy get something going there so that then we could go and look at them. And I will keep you posted on that. Um, <clears throat> we are, I, I uh, with working with um, Blueberry, we have requested for the project manager for the Eastern segment. Caltrans has given us the project manager and it's Alan Lau, which it's gonna work nice for us. Now that we have the project manager, We'll start working on co-op agreements and so forth for the eastern portion of the project and get the documentation in for the August CTC meeting for the allocation at that time. I hope to be done with my request for proposals for the uh, um, eastern segment design work and project management work. I'm very close to that request for proposals being done I'll probably put finishing touches on that next week so it goes out around the middle of May. That's the target that, we're, that we've been shooting for to get out. Um, six week uh, advertisement solicitation and then that comes back to us and we review proposals and have interviews and send things to Caltrans so we should have a contract in place sometime shortly after the CTC allocates the funds to us. So that's the way that project timeline is working. It's working so far so good. Um, we intend, the uh, Public Works intends to have a booth at the county fair. So we will have some display showing wagon trail and some other Public Works items there too, including our stormwater projects, Pesticide information because now we run the pesticide program for weeds, uh, uh, roadside weed spraying. We're going to have our snow brochures there and all sorts of things. So we'll probably be soliciting your help for maybe a little bit of time to man the booth, okay? So we're working on that. Um, <clears throat> you. Uh, Supervisor Fallendorf, you asked me a question in regards to the, the call for projects for next week. Yes. Uh, let me have Kelly come up to talk to you a little bit about some of that. Thank you, Robert. Thank you. And, and we are, I, I do have before Kelly, one question before on the Ragon Trail. Um, we are back to work out there. We've worked out the asbestos thing yes. in the suits and the waters out there keeping it wet everything's yes. going okay yes okay. that's uh those are things that occur and we'll continue you know daily occurrences of things that we encounter but 
as far as what was encountered, I don't know if everyone knows, there was serpentine material encountered, which is not a surprise given the location is near Copperopolis. Correct. But that means then that the workers have to be careful, they have to have personal protective equipment, they have to deal with the material the right way and get make sure that there's water on it so that it's not up in the air and so forth. So th those are things that happen and get worked out on a continuous basis. Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So to answer your question, Supervisor Toffinelli, um, on Tuesday the 10th, we are bringing an item to the Board of Supervisors um, just to ask for permission to go ahead and complete applications for the Cycle 6 ATP project, grant program. And thankfully, um, you, the COG, your board, has offered to have Dewberry do the applications for us. So we're kind of working with them, but we need to go through the Board of Supervisors and ask for their permission. And with that in mind, tomorrow night we have a meeting at San Andreas Elementary School at 5 o'clock, 5 to 6.30, and we are soliciting, oh, four, maybe four. I have four. I think it's four, thank you, sorry. I was gonna be late, no, okay. Um, four to 6.30, thank you, Supervisor. Um, in the multi-purpose room, and we're particularly looking to attract people who live on Pope Street to this meeting. Um, and we want to make sure we get their feedback on whether they want us to do um, or what type of work they want us to do on that road. So we can incorporate that into the application. So. Well, in this effort, the outreach was uh, we went out there and put door hangers on all the doors of all the people on Pope just to make sure that we get them there to this meeting because with those other meetings, they don't come. Let's see what happens. And I think the setup of the website so that they can give feedback. Mm -hmm. I think we also created a website so that they can communicate, answer the surveys, and then bring the surveys and do them in person also. So I think they're getting a lot of feedback. I, I do have one question on the Cycle 6 grant. Uh, do, do we have a number that we're going after that we're seeking amount? Yet, do we know? I, I tell them off the top of my head, it is in the it's in the um, board packet. And what we did was we included the maximum that we could ask for, okay. um, knowing that we were probably going to fall somewhere under there because chances are we were not going to do everything in the program. Okay. We already know for um, the Murphy's Complete Streets program, Caltrans has performed a lot of that work already, so all of that stuff would come out of any grant application that we had done previously. So we just went for the max, knowing we were going to do less. And all this information will be in the agenda packet? Okay, thank you. Absolutely, yes. Thank you. Okay, are you good? Any other questions? Are we all good? Any public comment? Not on mine? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Robert. Thank you very much. Are there any other local updates? Yes, hello, this is Rebecca Nealon, um, I'm Acting City Engineer for the City of Angels Camp, and I just wanted to provide an update on the fantastic work the City of Angels Camp is doing. We are just about complete with the Murphy's Grade uh, Sidewalk and Bike Lane Infill Project. Uh, that has been going on since last fall, so it is just about done. They're about to put the final striping down. We've hit a lot of challenges on that project, but worked through on it. It's, it's, it's turned into a very beautiful project. Wonderful to get sidewalk all along um, in front of that high school. And then the other um, cog funded project that we're delivering right now is the um, Angels Creek Trail, and that one is just about done with the environmental. We are gearing up to get that ISMND circulated so we can move into the right-of-way phase. And that is all I have for updates. Is there any questions? Okay. Are there any public comment? Okay. Thank you, Rebecca. Okay. Um, is there anyone I'm missing for local updates before I move on to the next agenda item? We got everyone covered, right? Well, you know, I see that. Just making sure. Okay. Moving on, next we have item number seven, which is the presentation of the zero emission bus, ZEB, uh, analysis and rollout plan uh, existing condition report. And I believe we each had a PowerPoint, and then you're gonna show the PowerPoint online, right? Yeah, so uh, we have the consultant online who's gonna give a PowerPoint presentation of the existing conditions. 
You guys have a copy of each of your seats of that PowerPoint, but they'll also be sharing their screen. And included in the packet was the actual existing conditions report. Um, this item's informational, but we definitely want you to be aware of where we're at in that project. And with that being said, I'll introduce David Verbage of Stantec Consulting. And I believe Annalie Castillo is also online. Um, and David, you should be able to share your screen. Are you able? And you're muted, just so you know. Hi, everyone. Um, it says you cannot share a screen while the other participant is sharing. Let's try that. And now I can share. Thank you. All right. So. So uh, here is our presentation overview for the zero emission bus rollout plan that we will be conducting for Calaveras Connect. And this uh, zero emission bus plan is in response to the state's uh, innovative clean transportation mandate, which looks to transition the fleets of transit agencies across California to zero emissions. And so, uh, can you hold on a second, please? I'm sorry. Uh, we need to turn the sound up on our end. Hold on one second. I'll speak louder, but I'm getting feedback. Are you hearing any feedback? David, if you could try speaking louder, are you still getting the feedback? No. Do you still get feedback now? No, I don't think so. Okay. If you could just speak a little louder, that would be great. It's clear? Is this better? Somewhat better? Um, it sounds the same. <laughs> Let me try dialing in uh, from my phone, if you don't mind giving me one second, please. I think if you are uh, away from the computer, it might be better, actually. Oh, and I'll saying something. Um, uh, he's trying to call in, so, uh, which means I need to. I don't see him yet, but he said he was going to try to call in to see if it would make it louder for him. Okay, is this better? No. No, it's not better. Oh, but who was that? That's me. David. It's still pretty muted. It sounds okay on my end. I mean, we can hear you. It's just, it's, I guess, somewhat a large room, and we're just having the problems having the voice carry all the way around and to the board. Um, and our speakers were not able to turn up at this point. Maybe, Annalie, do you want to try and see if you're coming in clear? I, I think they're having the same issue with me. Can you guys hear me better than David? No, I think we hear you about the same. Yeah. I so think it's just a big room. If you I will yell. <laughs> I will yell and hope that my neighbors don't Perfect. get upset and uh, hope that other people on the phone don't uh, lose their ear hearing. Is that okay if I speak a bit more loudly? Sounds good. Yes, we're all for that. All right, I will yell. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for making the time today for having us present some of our preliminary findings of the zero emission bus plan. We're Stantec, we do this uh, work routinely around the state and around the country. We're doing zero emission bus rollout planning for uh, agencies throughout your area, including 
in South Sacramento County. Uh, we did the work in El Dorado County up in Placerville. And we're also working with Tuolumne County for their zero emission bus plans. So we look forward to working with you all as well. We have work uh, throughout California, throughout the country, where we're looking at zero emission bus plans in terms of electrical, battery electric buses, and fuel cell electric buses as well. So we're well versed in these type of rollout plans. Our, our approach is to look comprehensively at the needs of a transit agency such as yourselves to look at what parts need to be in place to roll out a zero emission uh, bus fleet. And so that involves many components, not just the buses themselves or the charging or fueling equipment, but also the strategy, the financial aspects, the facilities, the maintenance, and as well as the fleet. Is this okay? Am I, am I speaking loudly enough? I'm seeing head nod yet. What? It, it's working for us, David, for now. Thank you. All right. Excellent. So our project purpose is to develop a CARB compliant zero emission rollout plan in response to the innovative clean regu transit regulation, which stipulates that transit agencies across the state of California have to transition to a 100% zero emission bus fleet by 2040. And so we're coming up with the, the strategy for Calaveras. There are several sections part of this plan that will be compiled at the end of the study, including information regarding the, trans the technology portfolio, the current bus fleet composition and future purchases, facility modifications, service and disadvantaged communities, workforce training, and potential funding sources. Importantly, this information can also help Calaveras apply in the future for FTA loan funding, which was just announced this year that it's going to be a large amount. And we can expect that moving forward to be also uh, a commitment of the, of the FTA. So the project purpose is, again, to respond to CARB's mandate, which requires that small transit agencies, such as Calaveras' transit agency, start purchasing zero emission buses in 2026 with 100% transition by 2040. As well, this requires that the transit agency board submit a board approved plan by July 1st, 2023. So we're all on the way there. Interestingly, it exempts cutaway vehicles, motor coaches, and articulated buses until 2026 if there's no alternative tested vehicles. And we'll get into the implications of this in a bit because of the challenges that a lot of agencies such as yourselves are facing when looking at smaller vehicles and the need to swap them out for zero emission equivalents. And furthermore, CARP provides exemptions for agencies if there's an inability to uh, meet vehicle alternatives because of challenging terrain, for example, vehicle alternatives, operating profiles, as well as other challenges. So at the moment we've completed the existing conditions analysis, our next step that we've started to undertake is power analysis and route modeling, which will tell us how your, uh, how your agency, how buses, potential zero emission buses will perform under your agency's conditions and how we could approach uh, doing that in terms of looking at the, the, the need to move into a zero emission future we're also looking at alternative site analysis as part of the, the scope. We're looking at financial analysis, and then we'll, we'll assess funding sources and develop a comprehensive zero emission uh, rollout plan or roadmap, as it's called here. I'll start with the background on zero emission vehicles. The zero emission buses can come in two types, two technologies, battery electric buses, where propulsion occurs from electricity stored directly in batteries. Fueling occurs by recharging the batteries, like a Tesla, for example. And then there's this old other technology called hydrogen fuel cell electric buses, where hydrogen is converted to electricity for propulsion using onboard tanks of hydrogen and a fuel cell that converts that hydrogen into electricity and water. Fueling occurs by fueling, refueling onboard hydrogen tanks in a similar way to refueling a CNG or diesel uh, vehicle. 
a bit more background on this technology type. There's battery electric buses that charge in depot. Typically, these have larger batteries. They have a long range of about 120 to 170 miles on one charge. The charging time can vary significantly depending how big the battery is, how depleted the battery is, but typically two to six hours. Uh, the charging infrastructure can be a low power charger or a high power charger, depending how quickly we want to charge the buses, but that could also influence the expenses because the more expensive uh, high power chargers, while they can charge a bus quicker, they cost more to, to deploy. In terms of battery electric buses, excuse me, cutaways or vans, there are fewer alternatives. They typically have smaller batteries and that, therefore they operate with a smaller range. There's no on fast, excuse me, there's no on fast on route charging potential either, which is a, a benefit of having larger buses where there's the on route charging capability to top up the buses as they're operating. Vehicles generally are lighter, so fuel efficiency is better than the full size buses. So that could have a knock on effect compared to, for example, the smaller batteries of a of a cutaway compared to the larger batteries of a 40-foot bus. But fewer agencies have actually deployed cutaways or vans, so there's a limited amount of information available. Some examples of transit agencies that have deployed battery electric vehicles in terms of the cutaways or vans, passenger vans, for example, is AVTA in, in LA County, Porterville, and Auburn Transit. The prices here are indicative prices or representative prices where it's about $200,000 plus for a zero emission cutaway, which is about double the cost of a fossil fuel equivalent, or $100,000 for a passenger van. Again, about double the cost of a fossil fuel vehicle. So the, the, the idea here is that the costs are quite robust. The alternative to a battery electric vehicle is a hydrogen electric uh, fuel cell bus which is also an electric vehicle, but it uses hydrogen. And the advantage here is that you're able to store hydrogen on board, which means that you fill it quickly. You can refuel quicker than charging batteries. It offers a long range, 200 plus miles. However, there's a high cost in terms of capital for the vehicles, as well as the hydrogen, because of the, the limitations currently of the supply chain of hydrogen. In terms of cutaway vans, cutaways, excuse me, or vans, again, there's even fewer than, than battery electric. There's less, mature, less maturity. There's uh, a few agencies that have deployed these, SARDA in Ohio, MTA in Hawaii, and Sunline in Palm Springs are testing hydrogen cutaways or vans. Uh, their range can vary depending on vehicle size, which influences how much hydrogen you can store on board. But typically, this is 100 to 200 miles plus. Again. This is all very preliminary information as no agencies have really deployed these in revenue service yet. Uh, the costs are $200,000 plus per vehicle. So again, a very expensive premium over fossil fuel equivalents. When looking at some benefits or drawbacks of these uh, equivalents of these vehicle types. So some of the benefits of zero emission vehicles is obviously eliminates tailpipe GHGs. It has a near silent ride for customers and operators. And it eliminates noxious fumes in the passenger cabin, which is great for operators and customers. It offers a smoother ride. And in theory, because there are fewer, fewer moving parts than, an, than a fossil fuel vehicle, it's less costly to maintain a zero emission vehicle. And it's a more reliable vehicle. So it's less downtime. However, there are challenges and drawbacks. The key challenges are the double to triple cost of the, compared to current vehicles, compared to current fossil fuel vehicles, excuse me. It requires costly infrastructure upgrades for chargers and or hydrogen infrastructure for the fueling. We need to train mechanics and operators on the new technologies. It requires coordination with public utilities, especially if we're trying to upgrade electrical infrastructure to charge the buses. There are operational parameters that will need to be adjusted to match things like the limited operating range of these zero emission vehicles. And, and, and for, for Calaveras in particular and smaller rural agencies as well, the lack of maturity of zero emission cutaways and vans really puts a limit on the sort of 
things we can look at and what we can deploy, at least in the immediate term. But that's not to say that there isn't the ability to do that. We know that Calaveras is, is already looking to procure a battery electric passenger van. So taking that leap, taking that pilot, is, will be a good opportunity to learn by doing. I will pass this off now to Annalie, who will walk you through some of our key observations and findings. Thank you, David. And I'll try to screen as well, so hopefully it's loud enough, but uh, please let me know if I need to be a little louder. Uh, so now we're going to go over some of the specifics of the existing conditions report that apply to Calaveras. The first was doing an analysis of the operations. Uh, Calaveras uh, provides fixed routes, deviated uh, services, um, deviated fixed routes, and demand response services. The fixed route abilities that our service miles increased uh, in the years between 2016 and 2019. Uh, and obviously after that, there was a decrease due to the uh, uh, coronavirus. I'm not, I'm not sure if I'm allowed to say that anymore. <laughs> uh, then we got uh, the operating cost per hours and the parking cost per mile also increased between the year 2016 and 2020. The next slide. Um, we have a summary of the current fleet uh, for the cutaways uh, are used for fixed routes and the management services. This is a combination of diesel and gasoline vehicles and they come in a, a variety of sizes, uh, 32 feet, 26 feet, or 20, 25 feet. In total, there is nine vehicles and they range between three to nine years old, which is a good strategy for facing uh, the vehicles uh, with new technologies. Uh, and then they also have uh, two vans that are used for demand response. They are gasoline vehicles around 17 feet uh, and they are about eight years old. Uh, also, like David mentioned, it is being a quote for a battery electric passenger van that has about 80 kilowatt hours battery size. And the price is around two hundred thousand uh, dollars, maybe one hundred fifty-five with the grant. And if you put that into perspective, the most recent purchase of a cutaway in twenty nineteen was one hundred thousand dollars. So kind of just reinforcing uh, some of the things that they were alluded to, the increase in the cost. And in the next slide, uh, part of the operation analysis, we're, we're looking at the the mileage that these vehicles are operating. On average, the vehicles travel around 154 miles on peak uh, weekdays. Uh, the service mileage can obviously range between uh, uh, 50 miles to 194 miles. But if you see the majority, there is a, a large percentage of vehicles that are on the higher end of the mileage which again is representative of the large area of service that Calaveras uh, is providing services to. And um, this represents a challenge for replacement of vehicles on a one-to-one -one basis, given that the range of electric vehicles is, is currently limited um, and not near to 200 miles. Uh, not to say this is impossible, it just means there is different strategies that need to be applied and that there's not going to be you know, a simple one-to-one -one replacement without considering operational changes uh, or other strategies to meet the range uh, with the service that is required. And then on the next, next slide, again, uh, the service area is, is a challenge, it's very large, there's a low density service. And you guys have a very challenging topography with a lot of like you know hills and uh, grades in the roads, so that affects the efficiency, limiting the range as well. Uh, additionally, the the vehicles are out in service the majority of the day. So if you see the graph throughout the day, you have almost there is a peak of eight vehicles out, but in between the, those hours there is six or seven vehicles that are out all day, meaning that there is limited options for vehicles to come back to the yard and recharge and then leave again. Uh, again, this is some of the preliminary things that we have to assess to evaluate what options there are for uh, the operating range as far as the modeling is complete. Uh, and then on the next slide, uh, we are also looking at the specific considerations for the transition, one of them being the maintenance facility, uh, the operating base and maintenance facility. 
Serves a large area, uh, 1.13 acres, which includes the vehicle service, the fleet, and employee parking, maintenance and operations of the vehicles. Uh, obviously, there is going to be improvements that are required for the building to accommodate steering engine vehicles. Some of them require tools and a specialized diagnosis equipment that will be required for either type of technology, so either BEVs or fuel cell. And specifically for battery vehicles, there might be the need of having charging equipment inside the building for the maintenance purposes, as well as having the charging equipment outside or a refueling station. Uh, currently, there is no outside fueling infrastructure, so the U.S. do the fueling off-site. Uh, but if off-site fueling is implemented, open spaces could be used for the hydrogen fueling facility, or the charging of the sensors for the bioelectric vehicles could be distributed throughout the, the yard since there is plenty, plenty of space. So that is a positive. There is no uh, space constraints, and there is a lot of opportunities to accommodate the charging or refueling of these new technologies. However, the existing electrical system is not adequate to serve the loads of bioelectric bus chargers. So there is going to be the need of coordination. Uh, with the utility company in order to assess the feasibility of having an increase of power bringing up to the facility. Uh, and then the next slide, uh, general maintenance uh, for the facility uh, required for fuel cell buses specifically, a gas detection system that is compliant with regulations, uh, as well as increase in the airflow and ventilation of, of, the, of the indoor facility. There has to be an early coordination with local fire authorities. It's highly recommended so they can understand what fire protection requirements and concerns the community could have for either of these technologies. Uh, and the existing maintenance shop should be e equipped with fire protection systems. Um, this might not be the case for uh, the smaller vehicles. Usually 35 or 40 foot buses that have the body batteries on the rooftop of the vehicles. Uh, we have to get confirmation from the third manufacturers of where the batteries will be equipped for potential car waste. Um, so to, to evaluate if, if that is the need or not at this point. Uh, the next steps uh, include the modeling and developing a free concept that can, uh, you know, satisfy the requirements of your operations. As a quick overview, uh, we take a look into the bus specifications so we can see, you know, how the weight of the vehicle, how the shape of the vehicle could even affect that efficiency, how auxiliary systems, you know, like ramps to bring up and down wheelchairs, open and closing doors, how that affects, as well as the um, you know, weather and ambient conditions and how that vehicle provides uh, the power to the ventilation or heat. Additionally, we are going to take a look into the driving cycles, meaning if those vehicles are operating mainly in highways or in the city, uh, if there is a lot of high speeds, the same way your vehicle has a different mileage if you are in the city or in the highway, we have to analyze those driving conditions for steering mission vehicles. Uh, as I mentioned, the ambient conditions, if you guys have very cold winters and the utilization of the heating system could also affect the efficiency and, and the mileage of the vehicles. We also take a look at the passenger loads, meaning how many passengers are inside, because uh, that way could also take an implication into the uh, efficiency. And like I mentioned before, the elevation and topography is a key aspect for your system, so we had to have a closer look at that for each of your routes. Now, this is done at the route level, and then it's, it's escalated to the block or vehicle. In this case, because a lot of the services demand response, uh, part of that will not be going through blocks, but through average uh, of the mileage per vehicle for each service or each line. Um, and then on the next slide, David, were you trying to talk, or are you unmuted? Okay. Uh, so, like I mentioned before, the driving cycles are key. There are represented driving cycles that are already showing, you know, that behavior, whether it's in a highway or in a city. 
So what we do is we take a look at the key operations of the vehicles to each round, such as like the average speed of the route, the number of stops, and the traffic level. And then we assign those predetermined driving cycles to say this is what best suits the operations of this specific route. And as a, in the next slide, we show some examples. This is not a specific for Calaveras. This, again, is a example the the demand response services for a different agency and basically what we're going to be presenting is this for each vehicle uh, through the historical data or the expected uh, daily range uh, how many of those are failing and how many of those are successful so in this case this specific agency has certain challenges because if your battery instead of the battery or bit of charge uh, is below 20% that is considered uh, a failing vehicle assignment, meaning that that vehicle wouldn't be able to operate in the same way that a diesel or gasoline is operating. So a lot of the trips for uh, you know these vehicles historically would have failed. Uh, and this is assuming that you know the vehicles can operate in a range between 135 and 170 miles. We will be able to provide uh, you know, that expected range and that fuel efficiency that you could expect for each of your routes. And that will give us an idea into what strategies we could implement to make a successful transition using you know, either battery or fuel cell vehicles. I do want to mention uh, the options for fuel cell buses and, and the cutaway type of vehicles are, are non existing at this point. There are talks about the industry developing a cutaway hydrogen vehicle, but at the moment there is only hydrogen vans that are available. Uh, and in the next slide, this is showing you know the results for a hydrogen van, again for a different agency, but this is what you can expect. The modeling results will be is the type of information that we're providing. So there is significantly less failing uh, occurrences with the hydrogen van because they tend to have a longer range. And he, this also doesn't take into account that you know refueling a hydrogen bus takes uh, between 10 minutes versus refueling a battery could take an hour, an hour and a half, depending on the capacity of the charger. Uh, and on the next slide, uh, there is also an example of the bioelectric cutaways for a different agency, again, providing the percentage of the trucks that are failing, the range, and the average for efficiency. So in general, in the next slide, we can see that um, even though you know hydrogen might be successful in terms of like the modeling, we have to take into consideration that implementing technologies between the fuel cell buses and the bioelectric buses is, is significantly different. So bioelectric buses tend to be more cost effective and affordable for small fleets, and they tend to get more expensive the, the larger your fleet gets. However, with fuel cell buses is the opposite. Implementing a few number of, of fuel cell buses is extremely expensive, and then you start seeing economies once your fleet starts increasing. So we have to acknowledge that even though certain technologies might represent a better fit in terms of the operation range, when it comes to deploying those technologies, we have to acknowledge the size. Uh, and that is some of the things that we consider in the qualitative analysis. So once we have, you know, results from your modeling, we take those into consideration and we evaluate the different operational aspects that will be that will be affected with either of those technologies. So things like the scheduling and planning, the, the dispatch, what available technologies and vehicles that are out there, coast of ownership like I was mentioning for that scale, the service area, again, you know, topography, weather, as well as the training and agency wide by then. So what opportunities or challenges will that represent? And other aspects such as like how available is the hydrogen in the region or how available is the utility to bring that power. So there are things that you cannot necessarily like quantify but you have to take into consideration in the overall uh, free development concept. Uh, and then in the next step, so once you know the ball simulation and road modeling is complete, we take into account those qualitative assessments and we develop a preferred fleet composition in coordination with you know the, the, the people that are operating and, and providing the services so we can have an informed decision 
One there is uh, a free composition that has been identified. We evaluate what modifications are required for the facility, meaning you know hardware, infrastructure, better uh, charging equipment, as well as all the other considerations that we mentioned. But now they will be developed specifically for that free concept and for the conditions of uh, of your agency, as well as identifying the staffing needs for training and servicing of the vehicles, and that will all be put together to a final report that is your third mission world plan in a comprehensive matter. Uh, so that brings us to an end, and, and I guess we'll open the floor for questions and discussions. So thank you. Hi. Um, I'll start with Kim. Thank you for the presentation. Hi. Thank you very much. It was very interesting. I do have a couple of questions. Um, are the hydrogen-powered vehicles experiencing the same challenges as the battery when it comes to terrain and to cold temps? Yeah. I mean, the batteries go ahead, Anna. Yeah. Yeah. So there is obviously uh, some challenges is still being experienced, but the extent of those, I will say, they're. Uh, less significant than with that electric buses. Okay. The main reason being that batteries don't have a lot of lacking heat when they're operating. So if you have to heat up your, uh, you know, your, the cabin, you have to generate that electricity from the battery. While in a hydrogen bus, the, the fuel cell itself has heat, so that will provide heat to cooling up the cabin. So in terms of weather, uh, I would say hydrogen vehicles tend to have less of a downside in terms of the mileage. In terms of topography, uh, I will also say hydrogen tends to be a little bit more responsive uh, because they have uh, two sources of, of energy to provide power, being the onboard battery and the fuel cell. Uh, but that is also limited by the traction and, and power uh, system. So again, they are also affected, but the extent that they are affected is, is a little bit less than the bioelectric bus. Okay, thank you. Now, you referenced our facility would need major upgrades. Is, do you have any cost idea of what the upgrades would be to the facility, battery versus hydrogen? So we don't at the moment, and that's part of our analysis, part of our study. So what we need to look at is what's feasible and then sort of go from there. But to give you some indication, right, it gets more expensive the more uh, charges you need to add if you go battery electric route. Then the hydrogen route, it could vary significantly if we're looking at building an on-site hydrogen fueling compared to looking to fuel off-site. So short answer, we're not at that point yet, but that's what we'll, we'll, we'll get to. Okay. Thank you. Hello, yeah. Are there any other, John? And one other question on the, the battery electric buses. Do they work similarly to some of the hybrids we've seen where when they're obviously going uphill, they're using the battery quite extensively and getting very poor efficiency out of the batteries. However, when they're going downhill, I've seen a number of vehicles make use of the the motors in separate uh, in a separate use from the braking system so that they can actually charge the vehicles as they're going downhill and we do have a lot of grades where a vehicle may benefit from that technology yeah so both vehicles have regenerative braking so both that electric vehicles and fuel cell vehicles will be able to take advantage of that uh, where they're breaking and, and the, their generator system will be populating both batteries. So the fuel cell uh, electric bus, they also have batteries, they're just in a smaller uh, size, but it's usually enough to take advantage of their generator breaking that the BEBs will be taking advantage as well. So you'll see that benefit of both. Alvin? Uh, thank you. Good evening, my name's Alvin. And uh, my question is, there's, I have two real quick questions. Um, there's, in a, in a gas vehicle or diesel vehicle, there's miles per gallon. What is the cost difference between the two fuels? Is, is it so many cents a kilowatt for electric and so many for hydrogen? Is it, 
It, what is what is the cost per mile traveled, or, or do you know that? So I, I could start off. It's you're right. So it's not dollars per gallon, but it's dollars or cents per kilowatt hour for charging, and then for hydrogen, it would be per uh, gallon or per kilogram, depending uh, how we're looking at it. And then that would translate per mile. So I mean, Anneli, I don't know if you have any specific ranges you want to cite that they might hold us to it. But it varies, an average, it varies by condition. Let me give you a very political answer. It varies by condition. <laughs> yeah. I would just say in general, if you compare that, you know, dollars per mile instead of dollars per gallon, so if you're taking account the efficiency of the vehicles, you will still see a, a higher economy in the dollars per mile of the biological process just because uh, they're still more efficient than the hydrogen and the electricity tends to be cheaper as well. So even though I, I don't have it on the top of my head, you know, this is the price per, per mile, you will see benefits of the operations uh, for the battery bus over the hydrogen. But both of them are over twice as efficient and also cost as efficient as a diesel or gasoline. So even if you go on a hydrogen route, well, you will not get as many savings as if you were using a battery bus, you will always be doing like, uh, you know, half the cost per mile than a diesel. Okay, thank you. And then my one last question is, could you charge these buses with a generator? Uh, or would it have to be a, because we, we have had PSPS and power outages, and I believe we picked up people and took them to like cooling centers and stuff. Mm -hmm. So if we can't get to them because we can't charge, that would just be a concern with the electric vehicles for me, the hydrogen, yeah. you just refuel to my knowledge. I mean, I think you'd need a generator to run a pump, but that's, I, just, I, I imagine I have to have a huge generator to charge those vans, mm -hmm. so. Are there any other questions? I guess. Justin? Was that question answered? Uh, I would just say yes. We have this, um, the science systems that have all set generators for outages. Um, and then that applies also for the hydrogen facility. So the hydrogen facility we need to have also a generator that can, you know, make the fuel station function up. Obviously, the size is you know ten times smaller for a hydrogen station uh, generator versus the generator of the uh, vehicles. And the issue as well is that even though you have the generator inside, you're still going to need you know a couple hours to recharge your vehicles. And that also requires having on-site fueling for that generator that is only going to be used for emergency circumstances. So uh, there are a couple of systems that uh, can be applied. So either you have a generator inside with the refueling, or you have a contract that would allow you know, an external agency or external party to bring the generator on-site and have a hookup uh, to your electric system already in place to use the generator then. So but, but we definitely consider that into the final report in terms of the emergency response or redundancy of your system for both vehicle types, uh, whatever decision it goes to. Okay. Um, where is the closest hydrogen fueling station to Calaveras County? Oof. That's a good one. We should be prepared for that one. <laughs> uh, so, is, is there a right answer? Do, we, do you know? Because I don't know. So even, even if there is a close by station, the likelihood is that it's going to be a live duty station that is still disturbing you know, public vehicles. And it's likely not to, going to have the capacity to serve you know, cutaways and vans to that level of um, you know, how it's made. However, there might be partners that are you know, going on that route to supply that, but I wouldn't be able to say how close uh, those publicly available will be. Okay. And then the other question I have, is there any fleets that are running uh, hydrogen fuel buses? I think you mentioned Ohio or something in one of these pieces of paper. Like in California? Several, but not the cutaways. So some line is doing cutaways, but it's still early days. Uh, Annalie, you, you have some experience with the hydrogen vehicles. Maybe you want to chime in? Yeah, so I believe that they have installed on their uh, hydrogen vans. 
not cutaways, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, sorry, my bands, yeah. Has yeah. Bands. And I'm not aware of any pilot that has uh, running higher than cutaways. Um, I would just say, even though, you know, they're not fully currently available for the public, um, once there is a market that goes there or we see to implement, uh, just because they made that transition from 40 foot buses, 35 foot buses, and now with fans. So adjusting a cutaway to hydrogen is not, you know, overly complicated. I just don't think the manufacturers are seeing the market going in that direction just to make an investment just yet, but that might be changing in the future. It's, it's just no way to tell when that might happen. Okay. Well, and then El Dorado uh, Transit you have here is uh, has 51 vehicles. Um, Tuolumne is next to us. Amador is next to us. These all these these counties are close to us. Is there a way that we can coordinate and purchase vehicles, uh, similar vehicles that they're purchasing, to get like a bulk discount? Being that you're working with uh, multiple counties that are kind of close to us. Yeah, that's a great point. So. Uh, already the state has a contract for negotiated rates for electric vehicles uh, through the your existing uh, Cal Act MBTA uh, contract for cutaways and, and passenger vans so that's already you know negotiated rate uh, for state agencies in terms of looking for common specs with those agencies you know that's something that would be explored between trans agencies and, and staff there. I think it is encouraged, Anna will correct me if I'm wrong, but it is encouraged from uh, CARB to look to form joint groups to look for efficiencies. Yeah. Yeah, I think in fact you could even submit a, like a combined transition plan with an agency if that was, you know, put the, the fire. Uh, if it's a, it's a close by and, and then it aligns from that. So I, I do agree, CARB kind of encourages that. Uh, but with the the way that California has set up the the purchase agreements, if you are not into a coordination with another agency, it doesn't mean you're going to be at a dis uh, immediate disadvantage because that uh, contract is already kind of like negotiated freehand by the state, so you can get good prices even if you're not in collaboration with other agencies. Okay. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Isabel? Okay. Okay. I have a couple questions. Um, one question is with the electric vehicles, and maybe it's to Rado, um, with the CPP, the public utility rates going up? We just had that rate go up. Are they going to be working with? these mandate to help with the electrical costs because with a cog as small as we are that a big overhead that is going to be um in, added into our budget i mean the county i believe what is 300,000 that we just got increased in our budget alone just this year so for a size of our cog um are those considerations being thought through this implementation Okay, to the local, the CPPA, and I know the Board of Supervisors just had a study session with the county fleet and talking about electric vehicles. To my knowledge, I don't know if there's been any coordination, but I will definitely take that feedback and bring some information back to the council. Um, the next question or just something to throw out, we have hydro, we have multiple hydro, um, Plants, water plant. Uh, has there been any discussion on using those as a electric banking system to charge to have um, uh, the batteries charging station off of the hydro plant? Not to my knowledge, but I can find out. In okay, because I know a couple of years ago we were talking about that at UWPA of putting in um, battery when PSPS was starting and then running the battery that out. Okay. So I don't know if that's an option, even if it's just one location. 
I think uh, you all bring that information back. Okay. Um, and then what if Tahoe, Justin brought up, you know, El Dorado County, what if Truckee, Lake Tahoe, you know, there's higher elevations, they don't have the steep, or some of them maybe out to Mount Rose, but what are they doing in terms of snow um, and heat capacity with their fleet? Um, are they utilizing um, electric or are they using something different um, during those weather climates? Is that specifically for the vehicles that you're asking? Yeah. Yeah, so uh, if it's not extreme weather, the electric vehicles or diesel vehicles are using, you know, the energy from the battery or the, uh, the fuel cell to heat and cool the cabins. However, in extreme weather, what they're doing is they're using external diesel heaters uh, for the cabins. Now this is for larger, ve uh, larger vehicles, like 40 foot buses or coaches, because they're suffering from you know a very limited range from trying to heat the vehicle with the battery. Uh, now because these are cutaways, so those smaller vehicles or vans, uh, there might not be a need to use in these external heaters, uh, but it would definitely it's, it's always a recommendation from standpoint to to kind of see. And I would say, like, uh, David alluded to having this vehicle van will help with that and be able to see, like, is, is the heating being so extreme that we need to consider external heating uh, units, which, again, is being used uh, in, in the case of, you know, your topography and, and winter conditions, it could be a possibility um, to deploy that within your vehicles. Thank you. And one more other question. Um, with one of our routes going directly to Columbia College, has there been any conversation of a should, if we go the route of uh, electric or if there is another hybrid, we choose to coordinate with Tuolumne County to have one charging location at the college or a refueling with the college? I, ha I, do, I do not know. I'd have to okay. follow up with them, see if we could um, come to a mutual agreement or coordinate, and then I'd have to bring it back to the council. Okay. Thank you. Uh, is there any other board questions or comments? John? Well, along that same line, I would expect that the educational system with their bus fleet is being hit with similar recommendations or mandates. I would say the same thing. Let's reach out to CUSD or, or Bret Hart Unified and find out if their bus fleets are also being targeted or encouraged to become electrical, either uh, battery-powered battery -powered buses or the uh, hydrogen fuel cell. And again, I like the idea of if we can do a shared resource, um, that would be outstanding. Okay. Um, with that, is there any public comment? And I'm gonna start online. No, okay, is there, is, is there any public comment in the audience? Seeing none? Okay. Um, we'll bring it back. Um, thank you both for your presentation and answering our questions. I think really appreciated of that. Um, what do you guys need from us? Yes. Sorry, Tim. We extended the lease in the facility a couple of years ago. Do you remember how long that has to run? Okay. Information. Okay. You're speaking specifically to the transit? The facility, yeah. Yeah. I think we're in the middle of a five-year lease. Okay. So. I only bring it up because my concern would be that we're going to have to spend a lot of infrastructure money. Yeah. And I don't want to spend it and then find out we don't have the facility anymore. Yep. And at the executive management meeting last month, we had discussions on me following up and bringing back to the council um, information regarding the COG lease, which is up in July, and looking at the transit lease. So I've been gathering information and anticipate bringing it back to you. Justin? I guess to piggyback on that, is, is that a facility that we could potentially purchase? I don't know if we have finances for that, but... We've, we've asked that in the past, especially when we're making improvements like the gate and the generator, and there hasn't been any interest. Okay, so maybe we should be looking for a facility to acquire, because this is going to be a... This is going to be a major infrastructure improvement, with that, whichever way we, we dice it. And if we do go with that electric, even if we had to sell the property off, we could sell it 
where we could the, the county could utilize it as a vehicle charging station not only for the buses but for the public and potentially bring in some revenue on top of that I don't know, just throwing it out there so currently I have two locations and the specs and pictures and I will bring back to the council in June no <laughs> no. Um, okay. So, so this is information. All you guys are good. Nothing. Okay. Thank you for your time. We appreciate it. Thank you for the presentation. Thank you for having us. Have a great day. Thank you. Okay. Next is agenda item number eight. Um, what's wrong? Oh, what no over here? Okay. Um. Next is agenda item number eight, minute order approving the City of Angels request for an exception to the COG timely use of funds uh, policy and direction to the executive director to negotiate a loan agreement with the Sacramento Area Council of Government as a strategy to prevent CMAC funds from lapsing. Uh, Roger. Thank you, Chair Fallendorf, Council members. Um, staff has two requests in this agenda item. The first one is a recommendation to approve an exception to the COG timely use of funds policy for the Angels Creek Trails project. Um, the COG board approved 415,000 in fiscal year 21-22 and 22-23 for construction. The Caltrans deadline to obligate these funds for fiscal year 21-22 is September 30th, 2022. Um, the COG timely use deadline was January 31st, 2022. Um, as you know, the purpose of the COG timely use policy is to evaluate project schedule status um, early enough to give us um, the option to be proactive, um, discuss options, and not to risk funding to the region. Um, and I think we're all aware this has been successful um, over the years. Um, which leads me to the second request and recommendation. The city has requested through the Technical Advisory Committee, the COG evaluate the interest of other COGs um, in utilizing both fiscal year 21-22 and 22-23 um, funding. Um, this would give the city the time to complete the environmental phase, um, and then they would have two years to complete the right-of-way um, phase. There are currently no city or county projects that could utilize this funding. Um, they're not in a position to be ready to obligate the funds. Um, Amber was aware of this. They had started discussions. They started um, talking to Steve Vandenberg. He is a consultant with COG. Um, Steve has um, initiated discussions with the Sacramento Area Council of Government. Um, and their ability to utilize this funding. Um, currently, they're interested. Um, that is why staff is coming to you. We're requesting direction uh, to move on and negotiate an exchange agreement with the Sacramento Area COG um, and bring back an agreement um, for your review and possible approval at the June meeting. Um, the timing on this, this is the whole reason why we have the COG timely use of funds is because we're running up against these deadlines. We don't have a July meeting. Our June meeting is very busy. And when you're working with other agencies, you know, coming back in August may be tight to get this information to Caltrans and, you know, get it programmed. Um, I wanted to mention the city administrator, Rebecca Callen, is on the line. And the city engineer, Rebecca Nealon, is on the line if you had any other questions um, regarding the project. But the first request is like an administrative housekeeping. We know that this project was not in compliance with the timely use, so I want to document and acknowledge um, that we were aware of that. And that's the minute order approving um, that exception. And then the second portion of staff's request is to give uh, direction to start negotiating. Thank you if you have any questions. Um, with both Rebecca and on the Zoom, do either one of you have anything to say before I bring it to the board? I can't see. Rebecca Nealon is going to speak okay. up in just a second. 
Yeah, this is Rebecca Newland. Hello, everybody. Thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to let you know that um, you know these funds will be transferred off to SACOG. Um, SACOG has agreed to give them back to us um, as soon as we're ready. So we're going to give ourselves two years to get through the right-of-way process. As I mentioned earlier, we are just about to start that. Two years is a pretty pretty decent uh, schedule for that. And then as soon as we're out of that right-of-way phase. Uh, we'll be able to request these funds back from SACOG. So it's it's a pretty smart way to protect the funds. Thank you. Thank you. And this is Rebecca Cowan. Um, and I just wanted to say we would very much appreciate the council to move forward with this recommendation. Uh, this is an exciting project for the City of Angels, and we really would like to continue to see this through. Uh, John, I see you on my time. Um, we've been very successful at, with this strategy before, uh, moving funds to another agency and then getting them back to us and not losing them. Um, I see staff has done their due diligence, and I think the City of Angels has been very uh, upfront in getting projects done. I mean, the sidewalk project is, done, is looking really great now. Uh, what they're doing on Murphy's Gray is excellent. Um, I know they're working through with new staff and engineering, but it, it all seems to be coming together. So I don't have any concerns about the fact that they're just pushing this off. So I would make a motion to approve uh, the two requests, well, the first request of doing the extension um, and the second uh, I would approve, I guess, making a motion to give direction to follow up and do the uh, exchange of funds with SACOG. Do we need a motion or just direction? Uh, so the first item we do need a motion it's a minute order and it's not an extension we are giving an exception we have exception. acknowledged that staff is working on a resolution so we are just administratively documenting we understand the project was out of compliance but we know that we have a plan moving forward okay yeah i i understand what john's saying but um i, I do have some concerns with this um, and Melissa, you've been around for a long time like I have, and we've lent money, we had to um, lend money out previously. San Joaquin County took a lot of our money because we couldn't yes. produce projects in a timely manner. And that's where this policy came into effect. That's yes. when we brought this policy forward about that because we were getting in trouble with Caltrans and not getting our money. They kept cutting back our money because we couldn't spend it. So we, we turned that all around over the past several years, and this policy has helped with that. Um, and so my concerns are that is this going to affect us? It possibly could with Caltrans um, in our projects and getting funding when we need it, um, not only our regular funding but any additional funding that we may need for projects I, I just have those concerns because I've gone down this path before um, many many years ago and it took us a long time to dig out that hole as you know yes yeah so th those are my concerns right now and I understand I just don't understand how it got on the overall work project for 22 23 if we were back in 21 22 not in a position to even get and use the the funding for the 21-22, we, we agreed to 415 again for 22-23. If we knew it wasn't going to be there, why did we get the funding for that when it wasn't going to be in a position to start using it? Um, uh, and and I, I agree with John. The, the city has done a lot. They've done a lot of projects, and they've done many things to keep up on things. This one I know fell behind because of um, easements and, and other things. but. I just have those concerns that I need to voice because I've been down this road, as Melissa knows. Yes. Um, Supervisor Tofanelli, I want to assure you, I hear you. I will bring back an item that addresses, so CMAC is a four-year you know, project schedule. Every two years, we evaluate these projects just for these reasons. Um, the obligation authority is usually identified in the loan agreement and so when you're loaning these fiscal year apportionments you're loaning the obligation authority and then the obligation authority is coming back to you when they agree to give you back the funding um, the thing we are double checking on is because you know there's a four-year call and they plan out four years we will 
um, research and vet all of those issues and all your concerns, and I will bring those back to you. And part of the problem, you make, you make a very valid point about the timing of these funding to become available. We ran into problems when getting money back from San Joaquin because it wasn't in the time when we needed it. Yes. It wasn't within the cycle, so it added to problems going forward, as yes. you know. And so I've learned that lesson, so I have it on my list. <laughs> okay. All right. Tim? Uh, are there any other questions or comments? No? Um, this is Rebecca Callan again. Uh, and I just wanted to say, you know, I'm, I just started in February. We have a really solid group. We're moving forward very effectively. Um, we have every intention of moving as swiftly as we possibly can on this project. And we wanted to make sure that we had adequate time to deal with the right of way. Um, so we really talked through the timeline extensively, and we're very confident that we can pull this project back on um, after the right away and align it with getting the money back from Paycock. And, and, and Rebecca, I, 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 I believe you and I understand that. The, the problem you could be facing is the timing of the funding now. You're putting out 22, 23 funds in 21, 22. You may not see that funding until 26. So you're delaying the project not only because you don't, you're not in ready to use the funding, but you could be delaying that further out once you are ready because the funding being paid back is not available until a certain time that you will get the funding. And again, that's what we ran into before. Just to point that out to you, if you're ready in 2024 and you got to where you need the funds to start the project, they may not be back to you until 26. The next cycle. Yeah, the next cycle. So, just I will get those answers and I'll bring them back into the and present them in the staff report in June. Are there any other? Um, I think I was doing public comment. Are there any other public comment in the room for on June? No. no. Okay. With that, I'll bring it back to the board. If there's nothing else, I will have gone made a motion for the first item. So I will need a second. So Tim, second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca and Rebecca. Um, and then the Thank you very much. I am, I'm seeing that there was a consensus of the nod, the direction to go ahead and bring that back. And I hear the direction. I will bring it back. Okay. We're good? Awesome. Thank you, Rebecca and Rebecca. Thank you. Okay, with that, we will move on to number nine, which is a minute order approving the fiscal year 21-22 overall work program, OWP um, amendment number three. Kylie. Staff recommends the council approve the fiscal year 21-22 overall work program administrative amendment number three, um, which is moving funding between elements. Changes were submitted to Caltrans and reviewed and approved by the Technical Advisory Committee. The changes included are reflected and highlighted on page 60. We evaluated funding levels at the end of quarter three and made um, appropriate changes to meet the required minimum RPA that must be expended by the end of 21-22, which includes all of our 2021 20, carryover and 75% of our 21-22 RPA apportionment. If you have any questions. Are there any questions from the board? Okay. Um, is there any public comment? Uh, no? Okay. Um, uh, the only question I have is going forward, um, I'm hoping this cleans up and we're not seeing an amendment number four or five. Um, it's, these keep coming back and I know we were flexible at the beginning of the year given all the changes that were happening and a lot was ha going on. But I want to make sure that we're not continuing to do this where it impacts this close to budget. Okay, we'll work on that. Yeah, the major impact on this one was the ZEB. It was delayed. So we're going to be pushing forward. We're still making the state requirement date, but it was pushed back. So it was impending onto the next fiscal year. Uh, I just want to make sure it doesn't impact the budget cycle. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Kylie. Uh, John, your light's on. Do you have any questions? Um, no, I'll no. go ahead and uh, move that we do the uh, approval of okay. the overall work program amendment. Okay. We have John and then Tim. Were they second? All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Um, 
Next is comfortable court, verbal. Uh, is there any, I'm going to throw that to my life with him. Okay, Justin? Uh, yeah, just going back to this uh, zero emission thing, I don't, yeah, so I don't think the hydrogen thing is even a realistic thing to be thinking about. I mean, uh, it's a very, very expensive uh, infrastructure improvement. I mean, like even well, any electrical socket has to be a, it can't make a spark, fans can't make a spark, everything has to be sealed. So that's a very, very uh, expensive route, I think. Um, I don't think that's, that's going to be realistic for our transit agency. That is all. Gay? Yeah, give up. Um, uh, I'm in agreement with Justin, and also I'm looking at, I'm going to look into the exemptions that are provided here by the state. I think we're going to be having to use some of them just by topography that we have, topography that we have, and the ability to, um, we certainly don't have the huge buses that they have down in the urban areas, but we will, we will be challenged greatly to have a full electric fleet by this time, especially costs and everything else. Maybe by 2040, uh, they have improvements on electrical buses that um, they don't have the hurdles they have now with them. But uh, just going uphill, John made a very good point. It just tears up batteries down immensely, especially on larger vehicles. Um, so it, it's we. So I'm seriously looking, going to look into these exemptions that are provided by the state to allow us to have more time um, to be able to get the infrastructure in um, and make the improvements. I have um, a a um, problem with, as we talked about before, is where our our bus depot is or station is. That we don't own the property. And to put in all these charging stations uh, is going to be a tremendous amount of money to put them in there. And then we don't, if we get, we don't walk away or whatever um, from the lease because it gets so expensive. We we sunk a lot of money into it, and we're not getting anything from it. So that's the concerns I have. Alvin, um, I disagree with Gary. And Justin, everybody, and I didn't do much the last couple weeks other than COVID. I agree with Gary and Justin, and I just haven't been up to much other than I was on vacation last couple weeks, and it's good to be back. And we had city council meeting last night. Greece. <laughs> Greece. Do you, can you speak Greek? Can, can you say something in Greek? <laughs> with, 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 uh, I can say uh, Yamas. <laughs> <laughs> it's like cheers. So, oh, I thought it was like another beer. <laughs> John? I, uh, I, uh, looking at the zero emissions bus, I, I can see it as transportation wonks. We have no phrase now that I feel like I've been hit by a Zeb. <laughs> <laughs> Bad jokes aside, um, I actually have had some changes happen for me. This is actually my last month I will be serving with the COG as I'm moving out of state. You're moving out of state? I will be coming back to Calaveras County about a third of my time, but that's not proper to maintain a, a presence on the board. I have thoroughly enjoyed the last nine years, including uh, terms of ter uh, being chairman. This is an outstanding organization. We have a wonderful staff. Uh, the county has really um, come together, and the city is good to work with. And I'm excited to see how the county has been moving forward with all the projects they have. So for me, it's been a pleasure serving on this board. I've enjoyed using some of the background and education that I have to, to assist with the board. But I just, uh, I'm very happy to see where it is at and the people that are on it and the staff that we have and wanted to say thank you very much. Um, it's been a pleasure for me. Thank you. You will be missed. Thank you. Yes, John. Yeah. This is, uh, where, where, where are you moving to? What state? Uh, I'm moving to Tennessee. You're moving to Tennessee? My uh, stepdaughter and her husband and our granddaughters have bought a place out there. Uh -huh. And with their blessing, we are moving about half a mile away and we're going to have something. Well, I wish you good luck, your whole family, and yeah, yeah, and hope you do well there. It's uh, another rural county with a small town. Yeah. 
so that won't be much of a change. But the uh, area is beautiful, it's on the Cumberland Plateau, and it uh, will be a big change for us. But uh, I expect to, as I said, also be spending about a third of my time still in California on the family ranch, and is in, my son is and my sister too still live there. So. Well, good luck, John. Congratulations. John, I would like to say thank you um, for all of your years of service. Your leadership in many of those years was as chair. So I appreciate your service and thank you. Thank you, John. And I echo that. Thank you for your service. And it's been great working with you. Um, your knowledge and coming prepared is very good. Yeah, you're going to be missed. I know I'm kind of speechless. I don't know what we're going to do without you. <laughs> um, with that, we're going to transition into, oh, wait, we got item number 11, staff report. Aaron, you got anything? You've been quiet tonight? <laughs> it was a quiet presentation, Aaron. <laughs> Mike, sorry. Did I not? Sorry. Um, so in addition to the planning report included in your packet where I go over where our current planning projects are, I just wanted to say that for the past two-ish months, um, I've been attending classes that were recommended by Amber before she left, and I continue to search out uh, classes and trainings through all the agencies and organizations, um, and I've been trying to attend those. And, um, I mean, they cover kind of a wide range, but I just want to let you know that's what I've been doing. Um, I started with an intro to planning in California course on March 1st, so that was exciting. And then I've also done community involvement, communication, marketing, um, a grant writing course that I found super interesting uh, just on Tuesday, or yesterday, I guess. Um, we've covered some per a general overview of procurement, budgeting, and legal issues as well. And I've got about, I think, four more on my calendar the next month, month and a half, so just so you know. Awesome. Good job. Okay. Do you guys have anything? Kelly? Uh, oh, there I have you. a question for Aaron. Yeah? Um, Aaron, is there any way you could send me a copy of the VMT plan that was produced and done last in March? The SB 743. SB 743. Yeah, I'd like to see it. It says you went through a training program with staff and with city and county staff. I'd like to see the presentation and, and the plan itself. Absolutely. I'll send okay. you Thank you. Um, just a reminder, we have the ATP meeting at um, Pope Street tomorrow. You have a special meeting here tomorrow. Um, excited that the fair is back, so we'll move into CTA and see the Saturday hopper and the shuttle that will be working at the fair. Okay. Yes. Would it be possible to get these in a JPEG? Oh, I'm sorry. Would it be possible to get this in a JPEG? So that we can share on social media for you? Erin says yes. Okay. She will email you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay. And with that, we will join the COG and me again uh, next month, January for, uh, June 1st. January. Um, <laughs> just jump moving you right into the sea, Alvin. <laughs> uh, June 1st, right here. Um, and we will now move into the Calabas Transit uh, Agency. So with that, we'll call to order, and I guess you have that time, 704. And first on the agenda is our consent agenda. We have multiple items. Is there any um, board member that wishes to pull a consent agenda item? Seeing none, any public comment? Okay, no. with that, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, next we have regular agenda, which is public comment. Is there any public comment for anything not on the agenda? Nope. Okay. And next we have pay attention, Jevish. Hi. Hola, everybody. Cynthia Lawrence, Air Transit Services, Contract Manager for Calder's Connect. Um, so first I want to start off with saying sorry I wasn't here last month. Um, 
I have some family things that are going on, and my family is in Washington. And so that takes me away for a little bit here and there. Um, but I did, um, I coerced Jeff Cranfield to come back on board with us. Uh, he um, was our maintenance manager, but he also has background um, in CAL FIRE, uh, managing their transit, or not transit, but their vehicles, purchasing vehicles, managing um, staff and whatnot. So he's very familiar with our site. He knows the ins and outs, um, our routes and whatnot. So when I am away, he'll be um, there in my stead. So um, you're in good hands if Jeff's at the helm. So, um, so let me catch you up on a few things that um, have, has been going on. Um, our dial arrived. looks like we have an upward trend. Um, I'm noticing the numbers are going up, which is great. Um, our ladies in West Point are keeping us busy. Uh, and we have a couple people that are actually using the service for medical services over in Sutter, uh, Amador Hospital. Um, our fixed route, it looks like it's been staying steady for the last two months. We're roughly around a little over 1,300 passengers for the month. Um, so that's always good. We'll see what next month brings because next month, of course, is summer and things sometimes die down. Our hopper, um, I was a little disappointed in this last month. Uh, the numbers went down. We did have some rain and some issues going on. Maybe people don't like the idea of tornadoes, I don't know. So um, we did have a decline in our uh, hopper uh, service, but um, I'm gonna get over to World Mart tomorrow and talk with them, deliver some more pamphlets, um, and continue that outreach with them. Make sure we've got um, lots of information for the, the people that come there. I'm also gonna hit up Best Western and um, We've got, what is it, uh, I lost it, Travel Lodge, uh, Froggies, a few of those hotels. And um, it, it, they all have services, especially now that the, um, it's May, Frog Jump is coming up. We're really going to see uh, um, some interest in writing our services. So I'm excited about that, especially for May. Um, on time performance. Boy, we had a challenge uh, in March, 305, let me look at that, I think that's what it said, 305 interruptions. They actually had um, some road work, I think they were dropping trees up in Angel, or, or up in Arnold, uh, then they were doing some work in Angels uh, by Bret Hart, and then even there was some work, I believe, here in San Andreas. So they hit us pretty hard uh, the month of March. Uh, this month, I'm glad to say it was only 14 total. So we were, they gave us a break. Um, it's only the fourth, though. It's, <laughs> oh, yeah, you're right, last month. <laughs> uh, Still time. Um, so transit is hiring, as you know. Um, we're using Indeed. Craigslist, online paper. Um, I, I think we have something up on our website, uh, Calaveras Connect. Um, and so uh, we've gotten a few bites here and there. I have two people, uh, one just completed training. They're waiting to take their test for the CDL, drive test. Um, and the other is just currently in training. Um, they've probably got about another to maybe three weeks left, depending on when they get their um, their CDL permit. So um, we're still waiting for that. If um, we get them on board and everything goes well, we'll still need at least two more drivers um, to complete the service. Okay. Uh, projects, I worked with um, Aaron. We got the, the fare schedule completed, as you saw. Um, and then um, I'm gathering up all the things for a uh, fair for the booth, and um, we'll get those delivered over to the CTA office soon. Um, like I said, Jeff is working with us. Um, and while I was gone, um, he started working on uh, updating our bus replacement schedule. Um, it's really changed quite a bit, you know, the COVID. Um, 
reduced the mileage on the buses, but then now we have our new service and we've increased mileage on our buses and they're really going all the time. And they're getting to uh, their useful life. They're, they're right there um, at the end of their useful life, I should say. So um, his number one thing is to get that set up to present to Aaron. Um, and then um, we've also been looking at reviewing the electric buses and, and uh, trying to get some extra bids um, just to even look at going forward if we do that. Um, I think that's about all I have. Um, and John, I just want to say my cousin, she just, her and her whole family and her daughters, they all moved to, let me see if I can get it right, Murfreesboro, mm -hmm. just an hour outside of Nashville. Yeah. They love it. They absolutely <laughs> love it. So good luck. And Thank you. It's been a pleasure working with you as well. Thank you. Any questions? I, I, I will. <laughs> I did have one question. I know Ironstone is starting back up with their concert schedule as well. Have you guys reached out and coordinated anything with Ironstone at this time? Um, so with Ironstone, there were some challenges when we did provide the service. Um, and But this year, um, I didn't have the staff. It really requires quite a bit of staff to provide that service. Um, and the other is uh, they didn't have very many Saturday. Um, we were doing it in conjunction with the Saturday Hopper. Okay. That's the only way we could do it. Otherwise, you're subject to, um, what is that one? Uh, um, charter, charter rules. Oh, oh. So then they have, if it's anything that isn't along the same line as our service, you're subject to charter rules. Okay, thank you. So nothing to share, Justin. <laughs> oh. Okay. Um, is there any talk of when the Fairbox recovery is going to come back into play? Are we still? Uh, we're still not in that mode right now that we have to have a 10 percent. Um, is there any talk on any of that? When that may be coming back in from the state that we need. To start gearing up for that you know I don't know but I can look into that I think that would be more in our arena with the transportation with development the transportation. act so yeah. we can look into that and bring right. it back to you okay. and, and then we had ordered an electric van do we have any time date that it's going to be delivered again I know it's in our arena but you're here and it's going to affect you do we have any date on a delivery date on it Aaron uh, we haven't ordered the electric van. We have we a haven't. quote on it. We were looking at specs. I we are ordered it. No, we um, applied for LC Top funding as a prospective project of purchasing an electric van, and we've also applied for a grant to help us pay for it. But we haven't purchased one yet. Um, our LC Top doesn't even come in until June. Um, so we are looking at the specs provided and trying to figure out if it if it works at this point. So. But we do have we do have two vehicles on order, but they're not they're not EVs. electric though. Correct. Yeah, yeah. I, I know because I remember we had to prove that earlier. But I thought we had ordered this electric van. Mm -hmm. We had a discussion about it. I thought we were waiting for a date for it to be delivered because it was delayed. No, I'm sorry for any miscommunication, but we haven't not ordered it yet. All right, so in June we'll bring this item forward and we'll have um, a minute order ordering the van, correct? Electric van? Uh, yeah, we're going to continue we'll to look at specs to make sure that, you know, yeah. we have something that works with our services because we're because still highly concerned about range, um, as you guys probably with the CMAC, on. Would the CMAC funding follow <laughs> under clean air this, <laughs> it, that, that we're, see, it's clean air? <laughs> Okay, thanks, Aaron. I think we might have been talking about the charging, like with the bolt for stuff, and so we're going to look into that yeah, we before we ordered it. We wanted to make sure to get the bolt. Right. Yeah, we, we talked about a bus. We did. We talked about a, a, a van, not a bus, but a van, mm -hmm. to electric van to get started on this mm -hmm. program. I'm sorry I'm not on, Susan, but we did talk about an electric van. 
to get started, not a bus, but a van that we could skip around San Andreas and up to West Point or whatever. And I thought, for some reason, I thought we'd ordered it and we were waiting its delivery. So, okay. Any other questions? Nope. Okay. Any public comment? Nope. Okay. With that, um, if there's no other staff report, nope. Yay. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you actually do. I've been saving it up all month for you guys. So, uh, what you saw when you sat down in your seats and what's included on the podium as well. Um, I've included a flyer for our Saturday Helper Service. Um, as Cynthia mentioned, we started that in March. Uh, we're putting it on Facebook. Um, in addition to her going to Travelodge and Worldmark, I will, um, as I did, well not last year, but the year before, um, I went to Murphy's and kind of canvassed basically the whole Main Street. Um, and you have a lot of wineries because I think it's kind of, we had a lot of interest from them on having that kind of service available. Um, so I will do that as well. I, I need to order more flyers actually, which is a good sign. Um, but you see it there, so we're excited. Please share, pass around the information and the news. I've also included a copy of the fair shuttle schedule. That was included, um, or should be included, with the fair guide that they put out every year. Um, so we're including the shuttle, but we also are going to have a table of information there as well um, with our little giveaways that we do. So we're very excited for fair to return and have that opportunity. That's all I got. Well, you have something to say? No, I was gonna. I was, I, I, yeah, I, no, I, I was no, not. I was just gonna say, didn't last year at fair time this meeting, didn't Amber hands out free passes to the staff and to the to the board members to ride the bus to the fair? Didn't Amber do that last year? When that did she remember that when she gave us all? There was a fair last year. We're also virtual, so. Oh. Yeah. Okay, so you're off the hook, Melissa. I can't even free one. With that, we will join and we'll see everybody doing first. Thank you.